percent today, as, as as Anna said, is on indoor poverty in in Europe on uh, adopting a longitudinal perspective, and this is shared work with uh, two colleagues from Trento University, Giorgio Cutuli and Paolo Barbieri, who should be among the participants, uh, I think. And of course, the merit is theirs, and the mistakes are potentially mine. Um, it's also work in progress in the sense that it's not published uh, yet. So if you have comments and uh, suggestions, they're, they're more than welcome. So a little bit of background. There has been in the literature a recent increase in an interest in, in inward poverty among the publications, for instance. Um, there is the one by Lohmann and, and Marx on um, on, which is a handbook on, on inward poverty in Europe, where we have also an, an, an integra um, a chapter in it. So, and the question behind of an increase, which recently happened in inward poverty is, is of course also whether employment is actually losing its capacity to pre prevent from poverty. Well, this is not necessary like this. Just to give you a brief uh, overview of, of what what, how the situation currently looks like. This is data from, from Eurostat, what you find if you Google uh, in internet. Uh, that's the, the most recent graph I found yesterday. So um, we have currently of about 10% of in-work poverty, which means that that's the percentage of employed persons who are at risk of poverty with a standard definition. Standard definition means that uh, we define persons as at risk of poverty if they are below the threshold of the 60% median income, disposable household income um, of their country, okay? And that increased by about, well, let's say 10 percentage points more or less over the recent decades, okay? And what, what you see in that graph as well is that we have a very huge variation over uh, European countries from Finland being very low and Romania being very high. Italy, of course, we are in an Italian context, so we're not always interested about Italy, is about, let's say, 12%. Uh, Germany, 10%. Um, Poland, let's say, around 11% of people who are working and notwithstanding are, can be classified as, on this relative definition, as poor. Okay? So there, there is uh, a relevance of the phenomenon currently. So, um, of course, the question is then, okay, is employment losing its capacity to, to prevent from poverty? And uh, the short answer, and I'm not going to go exactly into this, the short answer is no, of course, this is not the case. Employment remains one of the main factors to prevent poverty. If you look, it depends a little bit on how we, how we define it, but the uh, poverty rates are about uh, three to five uh, times higher among those who don't have any employment compared to those who do have employment. So of course, employment protects against, but still there's an increasing share of those who are working and notwithstanding are at risk of being poor. So now there are of course, individual factors, which, which is employment. And that's what we are interested in, especially as Paolo and Giorgio have been um, working extensively also on labor market deregulation and things like that. And then, of course, the question is how that uh, um, impacts on, um, on poverty risk so that we have increasing uh, amounts of, let's call that atypical or non-standard employment forms and, or maybe even an increasing polarization of labor markets. And on the other hand, we have uh, factors which also they are changing on, on the household and on the family level. And they might have um, an, an effect on, on poverty risks. And we will look into these employment factors and into these uh, family and uh, family employment and household composition factors to explain or to try to understand a little bit better what, what happens to what drives inward poverty. Then, of course, uh, there are, and we saw that in the in the descriptive graph from before. There are important differences between countries, at least when it comes to the distribution of the phenomenon. And that's why we adopt the comparative perspective. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, 
but there are talking about inborn poverty there are some definitional issues and the assessing the change over time of that concept is actually pretty tricky so while descriptively it's a very interesting concept and very very clearly also to communicate if you want to look at it in in analytical terms the things gets a little bit more messy and i'm going to show you why this happens so we have actually two criteria if we defined um, inward poverty. On the one hand side, we have the criteria that the person has to be in employment as a main status. And then that the standard definition uh, means that the person has at least worked for more than half of an entire year, right? Um, and on, so that's an individual dimension, which of course depends then on all the individual characteristics and it depends of course also on the employment position, on contract and so on. And we will go into detail there. And on the other hand side, we have the household level definition of, of the income situation, which we usually use for, for poverty. So poverty is, is actually always defined if we, if we talk about relative poverty, of course, as we do here, um, is defined as on the basis of the um, disposable equivalent household income, okay? And that means that, that factors uh, of related to the household structure, the household composition, and of course, also with regard to the household employment patterns or employment intensity, as we would call that at some point, are becoming relevant. And by that combination of individual characteristics and household characteristics, that makes it a little bit tricky to analyze, um, especially the change over historical time. So think about an, an effect of a crisis. We can easily imagine that the crisis effect even declines um, the, the incidence of, of inward poverty. Why that? Because if people are losing their jobs, well, they're no longer in employment. And given that, that those who lose their jobs during a crisis, for instance, are likely those who have lower the lower incomes and those who remain employed, so remain technically at risk to be at inward poverty, they might have um, on average the higher incomes. And that means that during crisis, we might even observe an increase in the incidence of inward poverty, like in fact we do in some countries. On the other hand side, uh, given that we have the poverty definition of on, on the household level, it might also be that, that members of the household lose their job. And through that, uh, actually the incidence of, of inward poverty over the crisis increases, right? Um, but to, 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 to disentangle these things, where if we look on, on, on change over crisis periods and things like that, is actually not that, not that easy. Okay? So, and, and what you see here is, um, is exactly that, that change. It's, it's on the right-hand side, you see the incidence of, of inward poverty. Now we have a little bit older uh, data here, but would you, you have 2007 and 2014. And in fact, you see that um, while for Germany, there is an increase in inward poverty between 2007 and 2014, if you look at Poland, which is, we, we actually see a decrease, okay? And the reason for that is exactly most likely due to who actually lost their employment. For Italy, we see an increase as well. Now, here we have inward poverty on, on the right-hand side, and we have low wage on the left-hand side. And the second aspect that, um, well, there, there are two things to be said on for, for that graph. The first is that um, it's a tricky concept, but it's also basically a structural phenomenon because the changes over the crisis years are actually not that massive. Mm. And I will come back on these, on these um, structural drivers of the phenomenon as, as one of the main contributions of our of our paper. On the other side, of course, if we talk about inward poverty, you'd say, well, one of the main reasons is, is of course, low wages, too low wages. Well, if, if you look at, at that, of course, it's, it's very, very descriptive and it's a very, very, well, very first approach to it. But, and if you look at the country rankings, well, poverty or inward poverty does not just boil down to low wage, although that might be, um, might be the immediate uh, feeling here. And I and 
I will show, show you exactly the details, how it does not. So what are we going to, to contribute here? Well, for, uh, as a first contribution, of course, we, we describe the, the phenomenon and we want to understand a little bit more about the, the stratifiers, the drivers and the dynamics in an inter in the international context. Actually, there is little research in, uh, in a comparative perspective and there's little research which uh, uses longitudinal data and looks at the dynamics. I'm not going to show you the details on the description of the of the phenomenon, um, but it's it's actually well established that in work poverty is mainly a phenomenon that regards males. It regards other adults more than uh, than young people. It is a phenomenon regarding low skilled persons, um, those in unstable, precarious, call it as you want, employment situations, of course. And, and we are going to look into these employment situations, distinguishing part-time employment, low-wage employment, which is defined uh, again as, as uh, with the 60% um, median threshold of, of the, the national earnings, hourly earnings, by the way. Uh, we look into fixed term contracts and then look into, to, into occupational positions. Then, of course, we expect that uh, being employed in a secondary labor market um, comes with a higher exposure to, to inward poverty. Um, then we are going to look into household employment patterns. So, how many earners do we have? And especially in the change of that um, over time. So what happens uh, when she, and it's the added worker effect is basically a question about the, the woman uh, increasing her labor supply. What happens in, with regard to, to poverty risk if she enters the labor market? That's there to um, come a little bit closer to, to causal effects, of course. And, um, well, sociologists have this long discussion about uh, social class losing its uh, its importance. If you if you remember about uh, you know individualization and and someone even uh, sustained that social class nowadays would be a zombie concept. All these old fashioned uh, stratifiers wouldn't count anymore. And we would like to to look into that uh, a little bit more. And that's why we look at. Well, it's not exactly that we measure social class, but we look at uh, occupational positions and we we um, we qualify for whom um, risks are higher and for whom and changes in employment patterns make uh, a big difference. And then, as main, this is probably the main the main contribution of that uh, paper. We uh, try to assess what is called genuine state dependency. So we try to assess a causal effect of previous um, in-work poverty experience on future poverty experience. So is there a causal state dependency of this status or is it rather due to structural conditions of the individual, of the household, which um, entraps families and individuals in, in poverty. That's the question. And that, of course, according to what we find, has important implications in terms of how policy potentially should or could intervene uh, to lower inward poverty. That is, of course, also related to, to the recent debate that we had in Italy on the basic income scheme. So the question is also, do these basic income schemes help um, beyond, of course, transferring money, money to, to, to families and therefore uh, easing their economic strain, which, which is obvious. And I will say something about that. Data, data is uh, EU silk data for the time being between 2004 and 15. I will show you results for six countries. We actually run results for, six, for 14 countries, but they just don't fit on the slides. Um, uh, as you, of course, know, except a um, few countries, EU Silk has just um, information for four years. 
given that the economic situation of the household refers always to the previous year, we actually boil down to three years. And on average, actually, we have uh, for our observations 2.5 years, which we can actually really uh, use. This is one of the, of the problems that we might want to discuss later on with regard to what we do. Still, we do have repeated uh, observations and we, we exploit it. We look both at men and women uh, in working age, in this case defined 1865. Uh, and of course, we consider the main personal and labor market related characteristics. We reconstruct the household characteristics in terms of composition, presence of children, and most importantly, that's what I'm going to show mainly, uh, employment patterns. We, of course, in order to, to define uh, the outcome variable, whether, whether the household and individual are poor, uh, we use total disposable household income, which is adjusted in this case using the, the modified OECD equivalent scales, um, including welfare transfers. That's a pr pretty much the standard definition that, that also was underlying in the, the, the first graph that you saw, the first descriptive graphs. In order to find that the condition that the, that the individual is, is actually working, we use this one. So working, that the individual has to be working for at least seven months in the reference year. Right? Um, independently of whether they are dependent workers, self-employed and so on and so on. Of course, self-employed is always problematic with regard to incomes, but actually it doesn't, if we, if we remove self-employed, it doesn't make a difference in this case. And we don't have any restriction with regard to working hours. Working hours, full-time, part-time employment will be one of our explanatory variables. So now the definition of at least seven months, well, it's, it's like, like always the sort of definition, it's, it's a sort of arbit arbitrary, that's what the ma major um, part of the literature actually does. Someone also uh, uses the condition of at least 12 months of employment. That would have been very problematic in our case, however, given that we, we want to, to dig into a little bit more in these, let's say, atypical non-standard employment things. And if we look at uh, fixed term employed persons, if we then um, condition on the fact that previously they have been working for the entire year, we would really miss large shares of the potentially in work poor people. So that's why we, we at the end opted for that more than half of the year definition. But of course, um, one can one can play with that. Okay, descriptions of the phenomenon. As I told you, I'm not going to, to show you exactly the, dis the description of who it is, because that's very much uh, consolidated in the literature. Instead, I'm focusing on, um, on mobility. What you see here is inflows on the left-hand side and outflows on the right-hand side for our six countries. So inflows, what happens for those uh, from, from one year to the other? How many of those who previously have not been um, in work poor become in work poor the next year? These are these three, 3.5, 3 3.7%, okay? So, so not the massive phenomenon. More interestingly um, is what you see on the right hand side, and that is a very clear picture of the, how sticky the phenomenon is. Right? So those who are in one year in work poor, what happens to them to the next year? How many manage to leave them? Now here we have basically a, a division 60% versus 40% where in most of the countries, 60% from one year to the other actually managed to escape this position, this, this situation. Still 40% is highly sticky. Huh? Then we have these disadvantaged Southern European countries, Italy, but it would actually be uh, the same in, if we look at Spain, um, where almost 60% remain stuck in inward poverty. And that's, of course, a very, very high persistency of the phenomenon. Then it's becoming, if we talk about two years, it starts becoming, well, almost long term. No? So this is, of course, a, a very descriptive picture. 
it's definitely sticky, but we cannot at all say that this is causal. Might be due to a lot of other things. And in our third part, we are going to, to look into detail exactly into this. Okay, household employment pattern. This is the full picture. We are going to zoom into the Italian situation. You have the legend on the right hand side because these labels are likely not that much understandable. I'm going to tell you what it is. So here we have um, predicted probabilities for the fact to be in work poor. And you see it goes up to 40%, which is actually pretty high for different kinds of households. So this is the traditional male breadwinner household where we have one standard worker who is not in precarious employment, right? But there's just one of them. Then we have uh, a family where we have still just one employed person, but this one employed person is precarious, okay? If you, if you don't like the term, let's just, just accept it for the time being. Um, I'm using precarious as as, as an as more or less as a neutral term, but we, of course we know that risks for that are, are, are higher. So and pre precariousness can come in three different forms. So we have three different models behind it. The first one, and that's the blue dot, it is uh, fixed term employment contracts, FATG. Then we have low wage, the red dot, and we have part-time employment. Now, if we look at especially those who have one single earner and that one single earner actually has a low wage, well, then the in-work poverty risk is actually up to the stars with 40%. It is already a little bit higher for those with fixed term contracts, but the differences are not enormous. And it is a little bit higher for if this one single earner is uh, has a part-time job. The third pattern is the dual income household where both have, uh, let's call it standard employment. So they are not low, work, low wage, they are not part-time and they're not on, on, a, on a temporary contract. And that's actually where we do find the lowest um, in work poverty risks. Remember, these are equivalent uh, household incomes. If we have a situation where we have two earners, but one of them is non-standard slash precarious, well, except maybe for the for the fact that this one has has a low income, the risks are still very much lower um, compared to, let's say, the still to a large extent, at least in our Italian context. Um, male breadwinner standard model. Um, and even if we have two non-standard employed persons, well, risks are to a large extent still lower than to a single owner. And then we have three and more of whatever kinds there are, there are actually relatively few people. So the main message here is, and now I'm coming back on, on the full picture, the main message here is that one income alone is often not enough to keep the family out of um, out of poverty, and of course you know who usually is is the the, the the income provider and who might be the second earner. The second earner usually is 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 the, the female in the household. Now coming to country differences, in principle, the pressure, the, the, the pattern is, is the same all over. Of course, then we have contexts like the Italian where risks are generally much higher. And then we have contexts like, um, like in the Netherlands or in Sweden, where even you, you can live pretty well, even if you have just one income. So exactly in those contexts where we actually have uh, the dual income model more diffused. The one, the single income would would be sufficient if we look at it in terms of prevent preventing from from income. So this is the um, this is the first um, take home message. And 
even if let's say the second income is precarious, is low paid, is part-time, it's still at least from the perspective that we are looking at, is still much better than no second income. There are some conclusions to this, which, which we can like or don't like, but well, we have the empirical evidence and I'm coming back on that. So that was descriptive so far. Um, the next step is to look what happens to, to these households if they change. So we exploit a little bit more the longitudinal information that we have here. And for instance, well, here we look at, at Austria, um, that one with the, with the triangle, uh, that's, that's the, again, the household where we have just one breadwinner. And then we, we look what happens if, from one year to the other, this household gains an additional income. So a second person, she enters the labor market. And that's something that comes a little bit closer to, to a causal interpretation. And what you see here is that even in Austria, much more so even in Italy, um, if, the, if a second person enters from one year to the other into the labor market, poverty risk, of course, go, go dramatically down. They go down, so here we have from one, you pass to two, and here you pass from one to two, where both might be even atypical with the three definitions that you saw before. So low wage, part-time or, or fixed-term contracts. And even that is much better than, um, than having just one. Now, again, in the Southern European context, so the less uh, welfare equipped uh, countries, uh, the, the second income is, is very important to keep families out of, out of poverty. Uh, that's just to show you that we actually were using 14 countries. In principle, the story is, is the same all over. Hmm? Uh, the magnitude changes a little bit. Now, um, we have an economic crisis in between, and, and one of the questions was also, well, does that change uh, dramatically what happens to the importance of the second earner? And we, we distinguish these periods that you see here. So basically pre-crisis, main crisis, and well, some countries and leaving more or less the, the, the Great Recession, some, some never left it. Um, and, and that now pulls together all, all the countries. But in principle, what you see is that uh, the differences between these three periods are not that enormous, okay? So the story is, is more structural than, than uh, an economic cycle driven. And that's exactly our main message we, we, we want to bring with that paper. Um, although, of course, in, in times of post-crisis, uh, well, uh, the, the, the capacity of single income uh, households decreased even further, but nothing dramatically happened. Okay, so we were looking at, um, at increased labor supply within the household, and that's what we usually call the extensive margins, so more people in the household working. And that's what you see here in the distinction between, well, if you have just one breadwinner, the blue thing, and if you have two breadwinners, or if you have a change, and that would be the green thing, so one from Myanmar to the other, what happens? And that's the distinction between extensive margins. More people work in the household, of course, um, the lower is the poverty risk. Again, what we see pretty well is that that the importance of the second income is especially high in Southern European countries. France being, in this case, a little bit more uh, a Southern European country. But there is also what we call usually the intensive margin. So um, the single individual can also um, work more, where in our case, work more means work more month during the reference year. So now what you, what you see, for instance, if we look at the Italian context, that if you, um, if you increase the amount, well, if you go down to a, to a um, 
if, if you go to a second to, to two earner income, um, just working both, let's say half the year, you're basically down to the um, poverty risk of with a single earner household where the single earner works the entire year, right? So, um, he, and then of course you could you could cumulate, cumulate this. Of course, the best situation if you have if you have two two earners who, who are full employed for the entire uh, for the entire year, right? That's just a distinction between um, extensive and intensive margins. Both are relevant in some cases. It's really the second earner which makes the big difference because you see this big gap here. Okay. For whom? So that were basically all employed uh, persons independently on their occupations they, they hold on the, on the, let's say, the labor market segment they are in. Now we start to stratify, and that's basically the same result that you saw from before. So we have one income households, we have those with two incomes, and we have those where we observe a change from one year to the other, so the added worker effect. The difference is that we um, stratify by occupational positions. Well, we would love to call that social class. It's actually not social class. It's just ISCO main groups. Now, I suppose that you are minimally uh, familiar with ISCO main groups. The higher it is, the more qualified you are. So here we have professionals and managers in the groups of uh, one and two. In those uh, below six, we have um, the less qualified, manual, unskilled, uh, routine employees. And then we have um, something in the middle, technical occupations, five clerks and, 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 and some service workers in, in, in this red three, four category. Um, so this is not social class, of course, but uh, it, it comes it comes close to that. And for what we what we need here, it, it can actually do. So of course, the first thing to to note from that is that um, poverty risks for the lower qualified occupations are definitely much much higher in all countries. The extent to which this is the case varies a little bit, but, but it's, it's there, wherever you look. Um, and these differences between occupational positions are particularly pronounced um, for those who have just one income. So our first category, let's call it the main breadwinner model. So coming back on that on that uh, social class is a zombie concept. Individualization uh, killed all the the old stratifi stratifying variables. Well, it, it's definitely not the case. Uh, our phenomenon is, is strongly stratified by occupational positions. What we're more interested in here is to what extent um, changes or, or the type of the household employment patterns can actually compensate. Um, for this stratification. And it can to some extent. So again, we focus on the comparison between those who are in, who have just one income and then pass to a second earner entering from one year to the other in, in the labor market. And what you see is that, decline, that the decline in poverty risks is actually particularly strong for those who are on the bottom categories of the occupational qualification. So to some extent, the household employment pattern can outweigh social class for the Ogolet, the social class effects. Mm -hmm. And that comes with important implications if, if we think about of whom to push into the labor market. And that comes with the implication um, with regard to which women we should um, especially help to enter the labor market. Now, if we remember the, the discussion about um, uh, women and career and gender inequalities in employment, this is a discussion which, which actually focuses very much on high educated women. While here, what I'm telling you is that uh, probably in, in terms of these sorts of inequalities, a much more relevant 
social group to push and to bring into employment are the low educated, low qualified women. And they're of course, they're not going to become managers, of course. Um, so, I yes. have a comment. Yeah. Because maybe I'm reading the graph wrong, but when I look at it, I thought that like the yellow, so yellow and green in the one worker household is very close to each other and then it's actually increasing i mean in the italian at least okay i was looking at italian and then it diverges a bit so so like so the decrease is larger for for the green clerks than for for the low so that's actually in different story then. yeah but but well you also see that the confidence intervals are are overlapping i <sighs> I would be a little bit careful in, in going into the very, very details of, of where the decline is bigger and, and I would stick with the broader picture. And that, that's why I would say what's the decline, if you, if you look at the delta, the decline is definitely uh, stronger for those lower qualified, okay? And I wouldn't feel sure enough to say, well, it's, it's much, much stronger for the technical professions than for the unskilled. Um, it, it looks like, yes, but um, I would like to have really a little bit more data to, to have uh, stronger confidence. But in principle, you're, you're right, yes. Okay, so the take home story is employment, uh, that the phenomenon is stratified by the old stratifiers, occupational class positions, if we, you allow me to use ISCO to proxy that, uh, but it can be compensated to some extent by household employment patterns. And that means that making low qualified women work is, is um, very imp uh, important. Okay, now final part. Uh, we saw that it's very sticky. Uh, now we would like to say to see something on whether this is actually to be interpreted as causal effects. So does previous um, in-work poverty create causally future in-work poverty, or is it due to something else, which then likely is some structural conditions of the individual and of the household? Now on the top you have the definition of what Heckman calls true, true state dependency. What we do technically is a, is a, random, a dynamic random effects probit model. You have the citations here, you have the formula here, and now uh, the, comes the part of the publicity of, of, this, um, of this talk, because I want to make some publicity of the publication of some uh, more junior colleagues, which is Raffaele Grotti and always um, Giorgio Cotulli. They uh, published this ADU file with the impronounceable name of, well, you better read it than I try to, to pronounce it, um, which actually implements in an ADU file what we are doing here. What are we doing? We try to identify um, the genu, the real causal state dependency um, through the situation of the previous year, controlling for reasonably whatever kind of uh, unobserved heterogeneity that might be there. How do we capture um, unobserved heterogeneity? We capture it by the initial state, so the situation in the, in the first year of the observation, uh, by the initial um, information on of our uh, values of our individual time bearing uh, covariates on, on the means of our uh, individual um, time bearing Covariates, and then of course we have two error terms: one one time constant and one time varying. So putting in all these information should actually kill or control uh, all sorts of uh, unobserved heterogeneity, leading us to to the possibility to interpret the the previous situation, the year previous, in reasonably in, in causal terms. And that's what what's the outcome. Um, let's focus just on that. And okay, we, we plotted over the quantiles of unobserved heterogeneity, but that's actually not the, the main issue. What we are really interested in here is the comparison between the blue and the red line. What are the blue and the red line? Um, the blue line is um, the predicted probability to be, to be in work for, for those 
who in the previous year were not in work poor. The red line is the one for those who were in work poor. So if we had a causal effect, then we would expect that there are significant differences between these two lines, okay? And we also have um, two graphs for the initial conditions, but let's focus just on that. Well, they, these two lines are actually not different in, in any of the countries. So net of all these things that we have in our, in our profit model, the previous in work poverty condition does not have any effect on the in work poverty um, condition the year after. Okay, so our conclusion is that there is no genuine state dependency when it comes to in work poverty. There are findings of the literature underlying um, that also, if you look at poverty, in general, so not just in work poverty, you don't find any 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 causal effects. Um, reassuring is the fact, reassuring from, from a technical point of view, is the fact that if we were looking at unemployment, the genius state dependency actually would be there. Why am I saying that? Because of course, if we have just basically three years of observation, the issue might emerge of whether this is is it sufficiently long to, to, to play that game that we are playing here? And given that in looking at unemployment, we can find a causal effect. Well, it's, it's reassuring that, well, it's not just due to the data. Then I must say we also uh, had robustness checks for France where we have more observations and we have a paper on, on, on Italy where we are more detailed and we have, we have longer periods of observations. And the finding is always the same. It's not a question of, of, it's not a causal effect, it's due to something else. So wrapping up, um, we find individual drivers and it's mainly a question of structural positions. Um, we, the phenomenon of in-work poverty is still stratified according to occupational positions, according to occupational class. We find strong evidence that the traditional household income model with just one earner is no longer enough, especially in Southern European context to prevent families from poverty. So that's important then to push a second, the added worker into the labor market, if you think about it in, in terms of policies. Added worker means she, because he is already working in most of the cases. Um, and that means that we have to focus on, on low-skilled uh, women mainly. And uh, employment creation should then happen on, on these lower. It's, it's about the, the, the low-skilled women in the South uh, who otherwise would not work. And that is not, it's not managerial positions. And that brings to a more general uh, question, to what extent um, Gender inequalities and class inequalities are actually interrelated with each other. And that might be a further, a further talk and a further paper that someone of our group might want to present. Uh, we find evidence that the, the labor market segmentation dualization actually is very important. I did not show you anything about welfare efficiency and welfare effects, if we, want, we might want to come back on that. Um, and there's well, there are, there are differences in, in levels of stickiness, but between the countries, but actually with regard to the patterns over time and the stratification patterns, country differences are not that huge. Okay. Um, junior state dependencies, we do not find any effect of that. Oh, so no causal effect, and that comes with regard to an implication in terms of policies. Um, from that point of view, it's not enough, and that's where we link back to the debate about basic income schemes in, in Italy. It's not enough to give transfers to families to lift them out, um, out of poverty in the long term. If we want to have that effect, we need to bring people into employment. And that's more the, the idea of work for versus welfare. So in that thing, so in work poverty is, is structurally driven as a phenomenon. 
And therefore, the policy response has to be on the structural basis. So provide education, all these things that we that we have in the social investment approach, of course. Um, and yeah, create, create employment. Create employment uh, probably also on the lower scale of the of the occupational distribution. Um, and make women work. So I like to co conclude with this make women work and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to your comments. Mm -hmm.